Sure, 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 sure. Recording has begun. What's that? Recording has begun. Recording has begun. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the fall semester for 801. Uh, thanks to everyone joining us who's not 801. Um, I'm going to make a couple quick announcements about 801. So, for all the EC students registered for that class, um, this is for you. The course is administered through Moodle, so if there's announcements or things like that being made about the course, it'll come down through Moodle, so make sure you have access to Moodle. Um, try to get here a little bit early. We want to start at 10.15 um, promptly. There'll be breakfast, um, so just make sure to work through that. Um, the other thing is starting with our next seminar, there will be a sign-in sheet, and the curriculum and attendance requirements are all on Moodle, which we'll go over. And there's kind of two things. There's a sign-in sheet that'll come through the seminars. And then the other thing to note is there's an alternative seminar form. So if, hey, you saw there's another seminar either on that Friday or some other time, and you're going to miss the EC801 seminar, but you want to go to a seminar in MSE or BME or physics, right? You can fill out the alternative seminar form, let us know, we'll approve it, and then that can be a replacement for one of the EC seminars that you might miss. Cool. So check out all the uh, stuff on the syllabus. If you have any questions, reach out. Most of you have done this before. The one other thing that about halfway through the semester, there'll be a survey that's required for all the 801 students to recommend future seminar speakers in your topic area. And you'll see that pop up on Moodle. So the requirements for this semester are attendance sign-in. If you're going to do an alternate seminar, the form, and then the mid-semester uh, survey fill out. Uh, otherwise, if you have any questions, Dr. Danielle, Dr. Pavlidis, uh, and I'll turn it over to him for today's speaker uh, talking to us today. Thank you very much. Good morning. So yes, we are very happy today to have um, Dr. Gerard Barron here speaking to us. He will be giving us a tutorial on quantum computing, which is uh, clearly a very timely topic. Uh, in fact, this talk is also um, a talk that stems from the time that uh, Dr. Barron spent during his scholarly reassignment. Um, and so he spent some time thinking about this this topic, this area, and uh, this is an opportunity for him to uh, share some of these thoughts and, and uh, teach, teach us a little bit about quantum computing. Uh, so a little bit about Dr. Barron before we hand it over to him. Uh, he received his BSc and MSc degrees from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Israel uh, in 1997 and 1999, and the PhD degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2003, all in electrical engineering. And since 2010, he has been with our department here at ECE at NC State. Uh, his research interests combine quantum computing, machine learning, information theory, sparse signal processing, and fast algorithms. So with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much. OK. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I kind of begin, I, I'd like to mention that uh, as was just mentioned, I was on sabbatical scholarly leave during the 2021-2022 year when I started uh, studying this material. Uh, I also want to mention that my, my colleague Arun uh, was scheduled to give the first uh, seminar of the semester, and he had some uh, travel surprises. And uh, then uh, Michael and Spiros kindly suggested that uh, I could kind of uh, give uh, a related talk, so he was also going to give a quantum information type of talk, and uh, we figured that a quantum talk would be helpful and even more helpful to make a tutorial so people would get a beginning of understanding of the material. Uh, we also want to kind of reach out to students. There's a lot of research activity. Uh, question? Microphone. Microphone. Do you want me to increase the volume? Let's increase the volume. Better? OK, so now, now that you can actually hear me, I'm going to repeat everything and you'll be bored. No, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. Uh, there's a lot of research on campus in quantum computing, quite a bit in our department, also in, in other departments. And uh, those of you who become interested are welcome to approach us. I'll mention quite a bit about that toward uh, the end of the talk. And I think with that, we can start. Uh, quantum computing is, has gotten a lot of interest in recent years on the hardware side, on the algorithmic side. 
uh, in part primarily because it can provide major speedups over classical computing. Classical meaning before quantum, uh, non-quantum. You know, what we have in our pockets and uh, what's uh, currently uh, showing us these slides. Uh, so, for example, a well-known problem in classical computing is that you're given a long, long, long n-bit integer, like n is 500 bits, and you want to uh, factor it into its two prime factors, well, assuming that they're exactly two prime factors. And in the classical world, that computation is uh, extremely burdensome. Uh, the number of uh, operations that you need is proportional to the exponent of n to the one-third. So almost as big, practically speaking, as exponent of n. So if n is 500, you need like a ton of, a ton of computation, quite a lot of computation to do this. And if n is 5,000, you can completely forget about it. I think the world record is like 800 or something like that. And that, of course, is you know using supercomputers and the works. In contrast, Peter Shore in 1994 proposed a quantum algorithm that requires less than n cube steps. Nowadays, it's uh, somewhat more than uh, n square poly log, something like that. N. And uh, recall that the difficulty in the classical world of uh, finding the factors of a large number, uh, that leads to the RSA crypto systems. And consequently, if we can quickly uh, factor large numbers, that has implications to secrecy and privacy. Uh, another quantum computational advantage is Grover search, where if we have a, a database with n entries and we're searching for one of them, and this is an unstructured database, it's not alphabetical or something. So you're just, you know, classically you'd be looking for entry, 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 on average n over two entries until you find the correct one, and uh, using quantum operations only squared of n. And this is this is uh, perhaps a less dramatic speed up, but still very interesting because. Uh, uh, you know, performing searches in databases, that happens in tons of algorithms. Uh, the quantum Fourier algorithm, whereas uh, we study the fast Fourier algorithm in the classical world, and it's celebrated for being capital N log N, uh, in the quantum world, it's lowercase n squared. And lowercase n is uh, the log of capital N. So to put this in perspective, uh, lowercase n is uh, 100, and capital N is 2 to the 100 in the classical world, more than 2 to the 100 floating point operations, and in the quantum world, the square of 100. Pretty cool. Um, there are also applications to integer programming, which is used in portfolio optimization and other problems. Bottom line, uh, the hardware is improving, the algorithms are uh, becoming uh, studied in greater depth. So um, you may be asking how, how it works, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. And the how it works was kind of uh, mentioned by Ryan O'Donnell, and I'm paraphrasing him. He said that, paraphrasing, quantum computers are good at looking for clues in very long, implicitly represented lists of numbers. So there's a lot of deep content in this sentence, and I'm going to parse it later, and we'll revisit this uh, sentence later. So let's begin with classical computers. Classical computers, uh, they process bits, zeros and ones, and uh, they use classical gates, nots, ands, and ors. And using the bits and the classical gates, uh, we will show how classical computation can be mimicked using linear algebra. And the linear algebra can even do more than that. And there's this cool result of universality that using a small number of prototype classical gates, we can implement any Boolean function that you want. In fact, uh, we only need NAND gates. And with NAND gates, uh, you can implement anything you want. So if you know how to generate a NAND gate and you know how to generate a billion of them, you're in business. Um, but the physicist Landauer said that information is physical. So every information processing device is a physical device. And it needs to adhere to physical reality. And in the classical world, our classical computers are implemented with transistors, and of course they're physical devices, and they work well. And in the quantum computing world, we need to rely heavily on deep, integral, deep intricate properties of quantum mechanical devices, so that motivates us to study them. And we are going to begin by discussing 
postulates for quantum computing, quantum mechanics, three postulates. The first postulate is that any isolated physical system is associated with a complex inner product space, which is called a state space. So first of all, complex meaning complex valued, complex numbers that might intimidate few of you, and um, we're going to mostly ignore that, mostly real numbers. Yeah, we're going to mention complex a few times. Inner product space. So if I have two vectors, vector number one is alpha beta, and vector number two is gamma delta, then the inner product, and for those of you who are familiar with inner products of complex value things, reminder, this is real, real value. So the inner product between these two vectors, what I'm doing, I'm taking the corresponding pairs of entries, the number alpha and gamma, then the number beta and delta. And for each corresponding pair, I take the product and I sum up all the products. Uh, this is easy for uh, vectors of length 2. You could also do vectors of length 2 to the 100. And the inner product gives us some sort of correlation measure between vectors. So we need to have an inner product space. Uh, that is part of our quantum physical system. And the system itself is described by a state vector. The state vector kind of tells us where we are, the state of the system. So a prominent example of a quantum mechanical state is represented by the qubit model. In the classical world, again, we had bits, zeros, and ones. And here we have two corresponding classical entities, which are called ket0 and ket1. So these brackets and so forth around the 0 and 1, they're pronounced ket. This is called Dirac notation. Um, and really, uh, these are not scalars anymore. They, they look like uh, these brackets and so on around the 0 and the 1, but they actually represent length 2 vectors. The ket0 corresponds to the vector 1, 0, and the ket1 corresponds to the vector 0, 1. And there might be a superposition of the ket0 and ket1 vector. So for example, ket psi could be uh, an arbitrary qubit, which would be alpha times ket0 plus beta times ket1. That means that, recall that ket0 is the 1, 0 vector, so alpha times 1, 0, which is the alpha 0 vector, plus beta times the ket1 vector, which is 0, 1, or the 0 beta vector. Alpha 0 plus 0 beta is alpha beta. Now, the amplitudes, alpha and beta, are called quantum amplitudes. They're not exactly probabilities. They're not exactly, we'll see what they, what role they play over time. And they're complex valued. Again, for our purposes in our talk, they're real valued. And they're, they need to satisfy the property that the square magnitude sum to 1. And the reason for that, we're going to see in the third postulate, is that alpha magnitude square is the probability of later measuring a 0, and beta magnitude square is a probability of measuring a 1. We're going to see that. So unit norm, the squared Euclidean norm is 1, which means that the alpha beta vector is on the unit circle. So let's kind of visualize that. We have the unit circle, and we have two axes. The horizontal axis uh, is the coordinate along the ket 0, and the vertical axis is the coordinate along the ket 1. Um, the place where this unit circle intersects the horizontal axis on the right side is ket 0, 1, 0. And uh, the 0, 1 vector is where the unit circle intersects the vertical axis. And we also have, in addition to ket 0 and ket 1, we have two new uh, vectors, ket plus and ket minus. So first, ket plus. It's 45 degrees halfway between ket 0 and ket 1. And because of that, it's 1 over square root of 2 ket 0 plus 1 over square root of 2 ket 1. This is, you know, pure geometry here, okay? And that's equal to, in, uh, in the vector representation, 1 over square root of 2 in the first entry, 1 over 2 in the second entry. We also have ket minus, which is kind of like you take the ket plus and you kind of rotate it around the horizontal axis, meaning that um, the vertical number the second number gets a minus sign. So we have 1 over square root of 2 in the first entry, and now minus 1 over square root of 2 in the second entry, also known as uh, 1 over square root of 2 ket 0 minus 1 over square root of 2 ket 1. 
Uh, quick comment, this can also be extended to complex numbers with a block sphere, but not, not going to be considered at all in our talk. So that's the first postulate. There exists a state space. Uh, one qubit, state spaces of two numbers, two qubits, four numbers. We'll, we'll see these details. Second postulate, evolution, quantum evolution. If you have a closed quantum system, then it evolves through unitary transformation with a matrix U, meaning that if currently your state is uh, ket psi, then the new state, ket psi prime, is equal to the matrix U multiplied by ket psi. What is a unitary matrix U? Well, it's a matrix, so it needs to be a linear operator. That's pretty clear. But there's more than that. Unitary transformations, they preserve length. And recall that we're in an inner product space, so we have lengths. And preserving lengths means that we have, uh, if we have unit norm at the input, so we have a valid probability one type of vector, then at the output after multiplying by a unitary transformation, we still have unit norm. So that's, that's good. And geometrically, this really means rotations, possibly flipping. So, you know, around, let's say, the horizontal axis or vertical axis, as we saw earlier between the plus and the minus. So the real take home point here is that quantum gates rotate the state vector. So we have vectors and we now rotate them. So let's have two examples that work on one qubit, single qubit gate. So the first single qubit gate is the X gate, which is the quantum analog of the dot. So in the classical world, not zero is one and not one is zero. So the X gate, X applied to ket zero is ket one and X applied to ket one is ket zero. So we can re represent it with an input and then in the quantum world, we represent quantum gates that time goes from the left toward the right. So at the left, we have the input and then we have the X block and at the right, we have the output. And recall this is a, this is all linear algebra, so we have superpositions. And because we have superpositions, if our uh, input is alpha ket zero plus beta ket one, we get alpha times ket one plus beta times ket zero. Or in other words, uh, the alpha beta vector should become beta alpha. So we can actually represent this X gate with a matrix form. The matrix is a two by two matrix. That's the type of matrix that you need to, uh, to be unitary for length two vectors. And its first row is zero, one. Its second row is one, zero. And when you multiply this matrix by alpha beta, we get beta alpha as desired. Another interesting property is that if you take this uh, matrix and square it, meaning you multiply it by itself, you get one, zero, zero, one, which is the identity matrix, or I. Any questions? All right, so maybe, maybe I'll have a quiz if things are so clear. <laughs> um, another gate. We started with X gates that are ORs, now the Hadamard gate, which is denoted by H. Uh, let's immediately look at its matrix. H is one over square root of two, one, one in the top row, one, negative one in the second row. We also have, because, of, because this matrix is symmetric, one, one in the first column, one, negative one in the second column. So now let's apply H to our two, uh, our two vectors, ket zero and ket one. When H is applied to ket zero, ket zero is the, the one zero vector. That means that it's picking off the first column and the first column is one over square root of two times the vector one one. Uh, alternately, that represents uh, the state one over square root of two ket zero plus one over square root of two ket one, which re recall that we call that the plus state. And then when we apply H to ket one, uh, again, ket one is the zero one vector and multiplying a matrix by the zero one vector picks off the second column. And the second column of the matrix is one over square root of two multiplied by one minus one. So the outcome is that you have one over square root of two times ket zero plus or minus one over square root of two ket one, 
And earlier I said that when the plus becomes minus, uh, that's the difference between a ket plus and a ket minus. So bottom line, the Hadamard applied to ket one is ket minus. Again, um, when we take the Hadamard matrix H and we square it, it's equal to the identity. As before, when we square the X matrix, uh, these are not coincidences, but you know, we're not going to get into the details. So that's postulate two. And now the third postulate, which I kind of alluded to earlier in passing, alpha and beta are uh, the quantum magnitudes that correspond to the ket zero and ket one components. And the probabilities of measuring zero or one are the squared magnitudes of alpha and beta respectively. And that's it. That's the only thing that we can measure. So now we can understand why the state vectors, the alpha beta, must have unit norm. Because we can only measure 0 and 1. And the probability of getting either of these outcomes must be 1. And because these are two different disjoint probability events, uh, the probability is magnitude of alpha squared plus magnitude of beta squared must be 1. So these are unit norm vectors. And another comment is that we measure 0 and 1. And after doing so, there's what is often called a collapse of uh, the vector to ket 0 or ket 1. So whereas earlier we had some information in the amplitude alpha and beta, we lose that information. Now we have only either ket 0 or ket 1. A bit more about measuring. So first of all, we often interpret when we're uh, discussing things in ECE, we interpret randomness as I have physical reality. I'm uh, tossing a coin, and I'll see if it lands on heads or tails. And I don't really know all the intricacies of the coin and how quickly the wind is blowing and whether you were spinning your fingers. If I had all that information, I might be able to characterize the cone better, but I don't. So instead of that, I say, well, it's random. I give up. I say it's close to 50-50. Uh, we'll repeat the experiment a million times. We'll, we'll, we'll verify that it's indeed 50-50, and we'll move on. But that's not what probability means in the quantum world. In the quantum world, these alpha and beta magnitudes are part of nature. There's no, uh, we don't have the entirety of the model. If you actually know alpha and beta, it's still probabilistic. That's nature. And another comment is that, uh, I was describing how to measure in the 0, 1 basis. Suppose you want to measure another basis, like the plus minus basis. So what you can do, you can rotate the plus minus basis to 0, 1, perhaps using the Hadamard or something related to the Hadamard. And after you do that, you're now in the 0, 1 basis. You know how to measure there. That's what we saw in the previous slide. And we're done. And it's not just the plus minus uh, basis. Any pair of orthonormal vectors will be able to measure by first rotating from that pair to 0, 1, and then measuring 0, 1. So you can measure along any orthonormal basis that you want. And the measurements are classical. There's zeros and ones. And therefore, we can do post-processing in the classical world, including, for example, that a lot of these hardware devices are noisy. And we can you know, uh, try to account for that in our post-processing. So overall, a prototype quantum mechanical system will look as follows. We have an input. It might be initialized to something. We have a bunch of quantum gates. They perform rotations. And at the end, we measure, getting us back to the classical world. So we understand, uh, we're starting to understand uh, a bit about quantum. And we're going to move from one qubit to multi-qubit Systems. Yeah. So what controls these probabilities? For example, if I have a given I can barely hear you. What controls these probabilities? For example, if I have an alpha square probability or some, some uh, wave function to collapse to a zero versus one, what would control how much that alpha square or beta square is? It's probably not always right? So uh, you're beginning with a state alpha beta. You collapse to uh, ket zero with probability squared magnitude of alpha, and then you're actually ket zero. You are the one zero vector. That those are your new uh, coefficients. Alternately, with probability 
uh, square root of magnitude of beta, you now collapse the ket one, so your vector is zero, one, and now you're 100% in the one state, okay? So think about it like you're a particle, or your friend is a particle, your friend is an atom, and the atom has two states, and uh, it could be in a superposition. The, 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 zero, the zero state corresponds to the low energy, and the one is the higher energy, and you can have a superposition of the two, so the, the atom is actually in both states at the same time, and, and then you measure it, you, you, you shine a laser at it, or whatever you want to do, and after that, after getting this information, you're now, with probability one, either in the ground state or in the excited state. Okay, does that resolve your question? Um, yeah, a, a bit. Okay, okay. More, more questions. Okay, so again, we, we looked at one qubit, but now we're going to do two qubits. And uh, with two qubits, we have four possible classical pairs. We no longer have zeros and ones, but we have pairs of zeros and ones. So we have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. And that gives us four computational basis states. Computational basis states are ket 0, 0, ket 0, 1, ket 1, 0, and ket 1, 1. And to, to revisit what I was just saying in, in response to your question, you can imagine that I have two particles and each of them is an atom with uh, uh, the lower energy and the higher energy. And ket zero one would mean that atom one, atom number, the first atom, is absolutely in the lower energy state. There's no superposition, no nothing. And the second atom is absolutely in the higher excited state. So uh, ket zero zero, ket zero one, ket one zero, and ket one one. And uh, they can be in superposition with quantum amplitudes, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, that correspond to 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Uh, and uh, again, there's a constraint of unit norm, because if we measure later, we're going to be getting either 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or 1, 1. And because of that, those, the probabilities for these obtaining these measurements will be the squared magnitudes of alpha, beta, gamma, and delta, and the sum of the four squared magnitudes must be one. So we just went from one qubit to two qubits, and now 100 qubits, 500 qubits, n qubits. We have a vector of length capital N, which is two to the n, two to the 500. And uh, it is a, a unit norm vector, and we're, we're rotating. So vectors, rotations, measurements. Another example. Uh, our first uh, two-qubit example, which will apply two Hadamard gates. And recall that a Hadamard gate works for uh, one qubit. Uh, so first qubit and second qubit are both initialized as ket zero. They both go through uh, the Hadamard gate, which is denoted by H. And recall that uh, the Hadamard gate takes a ket zero to the ket plus state. Therefore, both of them are in the ket plus state. And we can denote that by, by either ket plus, ket plus. Think of it kind of like concatenation. Or we can denote it by ket plus plus. And what, what does that mean? Ket plus is uh, ket zero plus ket one divided by square root of two. And multiplying it by itself. And recall that when I, in quotation marks, multiply, it's not, it's not the correct word, but if I multiply, let's say, ket zero by ket one, the outcome is concatenating. So ket zero one. If I multiply ket1 and ket1, I get ket11. One one. So what do we have here? Uh, the 1 over square root of 2 and the 1 over square root of 2, they multiply to half. Then I have four cross terms. The first ket0 is multiplied by ket0 to give me ket00. Zero zero. The ket0 is multiplied by, in the second parentheses, ket1 to give me ket01. The first parentheses, the ket1 there is multiplied by ket0 in the second parentheses, giving me 1, 0, and finally 1, 1. So I have half multiplied by the four computational basis states, ket0, 0, zero ket0, 0, 1, ket1, 1, 0, ket1, 1, 1. What about the amplitudes? The amplitude of each of these is half. They all have the same uniform 
amplitude. It's a uniform superposition. And when we square the quantum amplitude, we get half squared is a quarter. And we have four terms, each of them with probability a quarter gives me one. And that's fine. This is, this is unit norm. Good. Um, so this is a uniform superposition over two qubits. Two qubits have two squared states, length four. And we have a uniform superposition. And if we had n qubits and we applied n Hadamards, we would have a uniform superposition over capital N, 2 to the 500 computational basis states. Um, another example, a more interesting uh, two-qubit gate is the controlled knot, or C knot. What the controlled knot does, it has inputs, control in and target in, and it has outputs, control out and target out. Now, the control, it just has a control. So the output of the control is equal to the control at the input. The target, on the other hand, in the classical, from a classical point of view, and recall, everything is linear algebra superpositions. So classically, if the control is 0, the target at the output will be a copy of the target at the input. But if the control is 1, then we flip. So in other words, the target at the output is equal to the XOR function applied to the two inputs. So now that means that if we look at the four possible inputs in the classical world, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, well, the first two, the, their first qubits in 0, 0, and 0, 1, both of them have the first bit as a 0. Therefore, the control is 0. The target is not modified. So 0, 0, and 0, 1 are not modified. What about 1, 0, and 1, 1? The first bit is a 1. The control bit is a 1. So the target bit is flipped. And the 0 and 1 become 1 and 0, giving me 1, 1, and 1, 0. So the computational basis states, the KETs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, they, the first two remain the same, and the second two were flipped. And if we represent this as a matrix, then the C0 matrix uh, has the form very similar to an identity matrix, except that it's 4 by 4, whereas earlier we saw 2 by 2. The first two rows and the first two columns are identical to before, but the rows 3 and 4 are flipped, or alternately, because everything here is symmetric, columns 3 and 4 are flipped. So similar to an identity matrix. Uh, and in fact, this is a permutation matrix. And when we apply this permutation matrix to the original input, which we denote by ket psi, and it's composed of uh, c in and t in, our output will be ket psi prime, which is composed of the control and target at the output. Now, again, this is everything here is superposition. So let's have an example for a superposition input. Our superposition input will be 0 .6, 0 0.6 times ket 0, 0, plus 0.8 times ket 1, 0. Now, I didn't choose this randomly. The two magnitudes are uh, 0.6 and 0.8. Their squares are 0.36 and 0.64. Their sum is 1. So this is a unit norm uh, type of vector. And when I apply the C0, that because these are all superpositions, everything is linear, I have 0.6 times the C0 applied to ket 0, 0, which is, again, ket 0, 0, plus 0.8 times uh, the C0 applied to ket 1, 0, which is now ket 1, 1. So I'm getting 0.6 times ket 0, 0, plus 0.8 times ket 1, 1. Any questions? Yeah, at the back. So for the input to could actually have four different numbers. So if they just have two, zero six and zero eight. Here I have two implicitly the other two are zero. Right. Okay, so so the 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 Right, so yeah, in principle you could have four four non zero numbers, definitely. And this is a two qubit example. You could have four qubits, and then you would have two to the four numbers. And uh, one, you need at least one of them to be non-zero. It could be one. Uh, and the other 15 could be zero. Or you could have that three of them are non-zero. Could you, you could have that all 16 are non-zero. All four. But, uh, and the other thing is, you said a couple of times that for two qubits, you have four states. Mm -hmm. 
only two independent states. So they, they wait, so. Either two or three, but definitely not four. I think, I think you said independent, right? Independent, yeah. It is. So but they are. Independent do so they are not, they are not necessarily independent. So in the classical world, um, in the classical world, we're used to thinking that um, these two particles are independent of one another. And in the quantum world, any four, any four coefficients, any four quantum amplitudes that satisfy the unit norm are fine. Yes, yes, that, that's right, that's right, that's right. Well, the last, okay, the fourth one, you need the phase. The phase is what's missing. And my question is, two that are independent, then you have to choose the other two, then you have to choose the other two, or is it three that are independent? Three are independent. And the fourth, uh, you still have one degree of freedom, the phase. The, the magnitude you get from the first three's magnitudes uh, but its phase is uh, anything from 0 to 2 pi. Okay? More questions? All right, so we covered the three postulates. We talked about one qubit systems, one qubit gates. We had examples. Then we moved to two qubits. We had examples. Um, at this point, you might be thinking, there's a lot of linear algebra here. Is this just math? Um, Maybe I just have fun uh, defining notations and postulates from books and all of that. So the answer is that things get much more interesting when we ask questions such as, are, are these coefficients independent? And specifically, when we get into the topic of entanglement, which Einstein called spooky action at a distance. So we're going to have a circuit here which begins with, well, two qubits. Both of them are initialized at ket zero. And the direction of these circuits is moving from the left toward the right. We're moving forward in time, moving to the right. So we begin at the left with ket zero, zero. The dashed line, I denoted that by ket psi one. And then I have a Hadamard gate on the first qubit. And its output, the dashed line, is ket psi two. And then I apply a CNOT gate where the first qubit is the control and the second qubit is the target. And at the output of the C naught gate, I have another dashed line and that's ket psi three, which is the output. So let's analyze what's going on here. Let's analyze ket psi one, ket psi two, ket psi three. So ket psi one is uh, zero, zero. That's how we initialize things. Um, what about ket psi two? So the first qubit, the zero goes through Hadamard, the second qubit, Nothing happens. Uh, so instead of 0, 0, the first one goes through a Hadamard. It becomes plus. And the second one is still 0, so we have plus 0. Uh, another way of looking at that is that you have, earlier you had all your, all your weight on the 0, 0 state. And now the first qubit, the first bit out of the two, it could be a 1. So you have either 0, 0 or 1, 0. And each of these the 0, 0, and the 0, 1 computational basis states, each of them have uh, amplitude 1 over square root of 2. So we have 1 over square root of 2 in the first location, which corresponds to the 0, 0, and the third location, which corresponds to 1, 0. Then I apply the controlled knot. Now again, I have a superposition. And in my superposition, I have ket 0, 0, and I have ket 1, 0. A controlled knot doesn't do anything to ket 0, 0. It's still ket 0, 0. But as we saw in the example with the 0. 0.6 and 0. 0.8 a few slides ago, the ket 1, 0 becomes ket 1, 1. So I now have, instead of ket 1, 0 in the numerator, I have ket 1, 1. I have ket 0, 0 plus ket 1, 1 divided by square root of 2. And in terms of looking at it as a vector of length 4, whereas earlier, Entries 1 and 3 were 1 over square root of 2, and the other two entries were 0. Now, entry 4 has become 1 over square root of 2, and entry 3 has become 0. Now, I claim that the two qubits are now entangled, 
let me start explaining what this means. So this circuit, which generates ket 0, 0 plus ket 1, 1 over square root of 2, this is a well-known circuit. This state is called a bell pair. And let's ask ourselves, could a bell pair be comprised of two independent qubits? Could it be a product of two independent qubits? And we'll denote those qubits by ket psi a and ket psi b, a and b for the first and second qubits. And um, ket psi a will be alpha ket 0 and beta ket 1. And ket psi b will be gamma and delta. And when I multiply them, when I multiply alpha ket 0 plus beta ket 1 times gamma ket 0 plus delta ket 1, well, let's just think of, let's look at one of the coefficients, the 0, 1 coefficient. That means the first qubit had a 0, so it had an alpha, and the second qubit had a 1. So from psi b, we see that the 1 that has a delta in front of it, so I have an alpha, an alpha delta amplitude. My other three amplitudes are alpha, gamma, beta, gamma, beta, delta. And recall the bell pair, the first and last amplitudes are square root of 1 over square root of 2. And the two in the middle are 0. So alpha, delta, and beta, gamma are both equal to 0. And because of that, either alpha, delta, or beta, delta, beta, one of these would be a gamma, bottom, bottom line. One of them needs to be 0. But they both need to be 1 over square root of 2. So this is impossible. We have a contradiction. So it is impossible to have a product of two independent states. They cannot be independent. So what are they if they're not independent? So let's, let's have a, a thought experiment. So I have a colleague in the math department, Bashko. And here we are on Earth. We're hanging out. He's in the math department. And let's say we're in ECE. So we're hanging out separate places on campus. But overall, we're quite close. And we each have a qubit. And we generate a bell pair. And now Bashko, Bashko and I, we both have uh, friends. And our friends are going to go on, on very interesting adventures. Uh, I have a feathered friend, Io, and he has a, a furry friend, Tony. And Io and Tony are going to go on an adventure. Uh, Bashko and I, we hand over our qubits to Io and Tony. And additionally, Io and Tony, they both have a chronometer, a you know, sophisticated watch from the Middle Ages. You know, these are, uh, on the one hand, very stylish, uh, furry and feathered friends. But on the other hand, they also know quantum. And uh, they synchronize their chronometers very carefully on Earth. And after we do that, they go on this, on this wild journey. Io, she, she flies to Venus. Uh, Tony doesn't know how to fly. He's, he's a cat, right? He, uh, he teleports. Uh, again, he knows, he knows quantum, so he can teleport to Mars. And Bashko and I, we, we stay on Earth. We, we, don't wanna, we, don't wanna, we don't want any of this complicated travel business. It's too, too hazardous. OK, what happens next? They measure. Io is on Venus. She is a very alert parrot and uh, pays attention all the time, looking at her chronometer at the strike of midnight. She measures. Tony is kind of, you know, taking a nap. And because of that, the alarm clock goes off. It takes him one or two seconds to wake up. After he wakes up, he performs his measurement. So he's a bit late. And uh, both of them, they use our uh, intergalactic or interplanetary cell phone system to relay their information to us classically. And it takes a few minutes for Bashko and I to get the information. We're, you know, we, we're hanging out. We're uh, comparing, comparing notes. Lo and behold, uh, the measurements are matching. We repeat the experiment 100 times. Every time they synchronize the chronometers, everything's fine. Everything's matching. So why, why is this happening? So again, the circuit generates ket 0, 0 plus ket 1, 1 divided by square root of 2. Suppose that Io, she, she's on Venus. She measures first. Suppose that she measures ket 0. Now, it could have been either ket 0, 0 or ket 1, 1. That was the superposition. I cannot have ket 1, 1 because she measured a 0. So it must be ket 0, 0. If it must be ket 0, 0, then Tony, who is uh, on Mars, he must measure ket 0. What about if Io, again, she's on Venus. She measures a few seconds earlier because he's taking a nap. Um, she measures ket 1. 
it must be Ket 1 1. That's what this collapse implies. And because of that, Tony must measure Ket 1. So they're measuring the same. Now, you could think they're measuring within one second of one another. They're, I don't know, 10 minutes, light minutes apart, or five minutes, whatever it is. It's in the minutes and it's not in the seconds. How can this happen at the same time? Or faster than the speed of light? How can that happen? So, no, they're not communicating. So this is not simultaneous communication. The communication to Earth takes minutes. What's happening is simultaneous coordination. So that's what the entanglement means. Any action that I perform, uh, the action could be a rotation, applying a unitary transform. Any measurement that I perform, any action, uh, which is applied to Io will apply to Tony. Any action that Tony performs, as long as they're entangled, also applies to Io. So both qubits are now in a, in a, they're kind of together. They're now dependent. They're entangled. And this is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. And this has all been uh, experimentally confirmed. Of course, Bashko and I are, are we're not willing to uh, risk our feathered and uh, furry friends. And uh, they didn't do it, but you know, this was a thought experiment. So in fact, um, this raises a lot of questions. Um, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen uh, called EPR. In the 30s, they, they had suspicions about quantum mechanics. They, they were not really confident. And they suspected that nature has a hidden state. And, and by the way, uh, true story, uh, Rosen was actually a neighbor of mine. So we, we actually lived in the same building for several years. Like, incredible coincidence. But anyway, um, so what does it mean, hidden state? Hidden state would mean, for example, that Boshko and I were tricksters. We collaborate to set either 0, 0, or 1, 1, but we don't tell Io and Tony, and we put them at risk with all of these adventures, teleportation, flights, long flights, and so on. And um, all of this effort, despite us knowing whether it's 0, 0, and 1, 1, we just hid it from them. Um, nature doesn't work that way. So in the 60s, the Canadian physicist Bell suggested uh, an experiment that could be used to verify whether the EPR hypothesis was correct or not. And in 1982, Aspect in France uh, performed an initial version of the experiment, and that showed that EPR were wrong. And later, over the years, there have been multiple repetitions of the experiment. In 2014, in the Netherlands, uh, they took two qubits, they separated the particles by 800 meters, 800 meters takes several microseconds of travel. They measured them simultaneously within uh, less than a nanosecond. Everything, everything was fine. So, so basically, um, there's no hidden state. Additionally, this result and other similar results, they say something about physical locality. So physical locality is a principle that physicists used to follow. And it said that a particle over here is only influenced by nearby particles. It's not influenced by anything happening on Venus or Mars. But these experiments suggest that local uh, locality is wrong. And uh, quantum mechanics is uh, baffles our intuition, right? I mean, this is mind blowing that uh, it, it gets even more interesting. Uh, I could tell, I could tell Io, or Io and uh, Tony to measure in different bases. And uh, I could then get results where their measurements in two different bases correspond more closely than they ever could in the classical. So this story goes on and on, and everything has been verified experimentally. Um, so it's counterintuitive because our daily life is not at the particle level. It's at the macro level. And uh, the physicist David Merman, this is how he suggested to deal with our flawed intuition, just shut up and calculate. So we now have a lot of tools in place to start understanding what quantum... Yeah, question. Do rules and entanglement rules apply across time? So what if the parrot, let's say the parrot can travel back in time and the cat stays here in the nature? I do so not, I do, I do not know, but I've never heard of this. So I suspect that if this was correct, I would have heard of it. So. Probably not, but I mean, I, I told you what my inference mechanism was. So space is meaningless, but across time, um, 
Probably not. But that's, that's something that we could look into. Great question. Um, more, more questions? OK, so again, we've, we understand the postulates. We understand two qubits. Let's see what we can do. So um, recall that information is physical. Information processing systems need to be implemented in physical reality. And unitary matrices are reversible. Uh, so quantum functions need to be reversible, else we, they don't make sense. But some classical functions are not reversible. So imagine I have two inputs, A and B, and I'm calculating their OR or their AND. And the AND and OR functions, I have a single output. I cannot, from a single output, recreate two input bits. So there are classical functions which are not reversible. And what we can do, it turns out that we can add an auxiliary qubit. So we're now going to have more qubits than before. And this auxiliary qubit is called an ancilla qubit. And we will now have a reversible, a modified reversible quantum counterpart. And earlier I said that in the classical world, using NAND gates, I can implement any Boolean function that I want. Now using a small number of quantum one and two qubit gates, I can implement any unitary uh, transformation that I want. And this is not just on two qubits. This is a 500 qubits, so you can, uh, any 500 qubit transformation, you can do it. And recall, 500 qubits means capital N is 2 to the 500. So my matrix is going to have 2 to the 500 rows, 2 to the 500 columns. I'm going to need 2 to the, I believe, 2 to the 1,000, or possibly 2 to the 2,000, 1 and 2 qubit operations. You know, an incredible number, you know, this is not going to happen in the physical universe. Uh, but in theory, in principle, using a Hadamard, a CNOT, which is used for entangling, and one or two additional single qubit gates, the Hadamard is a single qubit gate, using three or four prototype simple gates, I can do anything, including classical computing. So if I can do anything, then um, what about existing hardware schemes? So there's been work in recent years on ion traps. For example, the, the company IonQ works with ion traps. And there's work on superconducting qubits. IBM works with superconducting qubits. And these technologies, they, they all have gaps. They have pros and cons. Uh, they're all noisy. But they can implement these prototype 1 and 2 qubit gates, which means that they can, in principle, implement anything, any, any, unitary, any unitary transformation that you want. So we now have, again, subject to that it's noisy and there are limitations and gaps, we have this very nice linear algebra playground where we can set up quantum mechanical experiments. And we're going to have vectors of length capital N, could be astronomically large. Again, you know, it may take 30 years to get there to, for the hardware to work well enough and to scale to millions and millions of gates and all of that. So it may take time. But in principle, we can start thinking conceptually about this playground where we're going to apply any tra transformation that we want. We can get there using these 1 and 2 qubit prototype gates. And at the end, we'll measure. And we'll learn things in the classical world. So let's see. How much time do we have? Are we until uh, 11.30? 11.30. OK, so I have time. Good. So that brings me to Deutsch's algorithm, which is the first technical content, putting aside the postulates that I covered, was how to create the Bell state. I'm going to cover one more technical uh, component, and I'll probably skip some details. And uh, the British physicist Deutsch had these ideas, formulated them in 1985, and to the best of my knowledge, that was the first quantum algorithm. So um, he considers a query model. What is a query model? So imagine that I give you a function. But it's a black box. You don't know what it is. And to keep it simple, let's begin by looking at a black box that operates on one bit in the classical world. And uh, what are the possible black boxes that operate on one bit? It could be the always 0 function. It always returns 0. It could be the always 1 function. It could also be the identity function or the not function. So four possible black boxes. Uh, we started with something really simple, a single bit. Later, we'll do n qubits or n bits 
more than one, but you know, we're starting with simple, something very simple. And, and here's Deutsch's problem. Again, this is from 1985. He wants us to determine whether f of 0 and f of 1 are identical. So we have a black box. Does it return the same thing for 0 and 1? Now, why are we interested in the query model? What, what is a query? A query is a usage of our black box. And um, looking at an interpretation, a modification of the black box, the black box is a function f. I now have a quantum implementation denoted by uf. So it's a unitary matrix. And my input x at the output will still be x. No change there. But the input y will become y x or f of x. So now think about it. I'm calculating f of x. And additionally, from the output, x gives me f of x. I can calculate it later. If I have f of x and I also have y x or f of x, I can get y. So from these two outputs, I can re recreate the inputs. So this is a reversible function. And therefore, it can be implemented as a unitary transformation. And moreover, not only can, can, can I convert this classical black box to a quantum black box, it turns out that the number of classical operations will be proportional to the number of uh, quantum operations. So the same computational cost, give or take, you know, a factor of 20, 100, whatever. Um, now, you may be saying, well, if it's lower by five orders of magnitude, who cares? But what if, putting aside this very simple n equals 1, what if the gap between the two was 10 to the 100? Then the fact that I have an extra three orders of magnitude somewhere doesn't, doesn't really matter anymore. So that's why the computer scientists who study quantum computing, they're very interested in the query model. How many times do I need to run my black box? And it turns out that in the classical world, I have the f function in a black box. I need to calculate f of 0. I need to calculate f of 1. I need to run my function, my black box, two times, two queries. And in the quantum world, only one black box query, as we're now going to show. So Deutsch's algorithm uh, begins with two qubits in the states ket0 and ket1. And using components that we've seen before, uh, well, first, the dashed line gives us, we're denoting that by ket psi 1. And then we run two Hadamards on the ket 0 and ket 1. So let's, let's understand what's going on. So uh, the dashed line ket, uh, ket psi 1 is, of course, equal to 0, 1. What happens next? Psi 2, well, the 0 going through a Hadamard became plus. The 1 going through a Hadamard became minus. Um, and let's just express the plus as uh, ket 0 plus ket 1 divided by square root of 2. And when we concatenate the minus, we have ket 0 minus plus ket 1 minus divided by square root of 2. That's what we have over here, psi 2. And the next thing that we're applying is the black box. Now, I have a claim here that when I apply my black box to ket x minus, the output will be the same thing multiplied by minus 1 to the power of f of x. So if, if f of x is 0, let's, let's think about this. If f of x is 0, then uh, minus 1 to the power of 0 is 1, so uh, input is copied to the output. If uh, x is 1, then I get a minus sign. Now, I said earlier that when we measure at the very end, we don't care about minus signs. We don't care about i's. We don't care about, all we care about is a squared magnitude. Multiplying by i or by minus sign or by plus doesn't change the magnitude. So we don't care about minus signs. Unless when they're adding up. And they do add up when we multiply by unitary matrices. But at the very end, we don't care. So, so now we, we need to think about f of x being 0 or 1. And we can break up our discussion into two parts for x equals 0 and x equals 1. And I'm going to skip this part because it's very detailed. And I did write it out you know, to verify for myself that I can do it. But it's detailed and boring. So basically, for 0, I have a derivation. And I show that applying uf, this modified black box, 
gives me minus 1 to the f of x times the input ket x, ket x1, or ket x minus. Same thing when x is equal to 1, so I've proved the claim and skipped the steps, but the steps are written out. So here I have my, cl my claim, and recall that ket psi 2 is uh, ket plus minus, which I also expressed as 0 minus plus 1 minus, divided by square root of 2. And let's apply um, uf, giving me, with a dashed line, psi 3. So the state after this black box, well, um, 0 minus, because of the claim, became minus 1 to the power of, well, x was equal to 0 here. So minus 1 to the power of f of 0 multiplied by ket 0 minus, plus minus 1 to the power of, in the second case, with ket 1 minus, uh, x is equal to 1, so f of 1, and multiplies by ket 1 minus. All the above is normalized by square root of 2, as we've seen multiple, multiple times. Um, so we know psi 3, and we apply how to bar this. But let's, let's recall what Deutsch wants us to do, or what he was trying to do in 1985. He said, I have a black box function, f. It's a black box. I have four options because it's a single qubit, so this uh, single bit is a super trivial problem, but forget about it. In principle, we're going to expand it beyond one bit soon. So it's a black box, and I want to know whether that black box is an all, an all constant black box or a non-constant black box. If it's a constant black box, f0 is equal to f1, then in my expression from the previous slide, minus 1 to the f0 and minus 1 to the f1 we don't care if they're minus 1 or plus 1. All we care is that they're the same. So I have the same constant multiplying ket 0 minus and ket 1 minus, meaning that I have plus minus ket plus minus. And the first qubit, the plus, goes through a Hadamard, giving me a 0 back. Recall, the Hadamard square was equal to the identity matrix. Therefore, the Hadamard is, the in, is its, its own inverse. And if 0 goes to plus, plus goes to 0. All right, so what if f is equal to 0? We measure, for the top qubit, we measure 0. If f0 and f1 are different, then uh, I get a minus sign here. So again, it doesn't matter if these are with a plus or with a minus, but the ket 0 minus and the ket 1 minus have a minus sign. They have different signs. Because I'm taking minus 1 to the different powers. So I have ket minus minus, again, with a plus minus sign, but it doesn't matter. Um, and the Hadamard gives me a 1, the red one, at the first location. So depending on whether my first measurement, the top measurement, will be a 0 or a 1. I know whether the measurements at the black box, f of 0, f and 1, are equal or different with one application of this quantum query. So that's, that's it. Now let's, let's go beyond this. Let's go beyond 1 qubit. Let's go beyond 2 qubits. Let's go to n qubits. Now this is, there are going to be a lot of leaps of faith, leaps of faith particularly on the next slide. But uh, this is an ECE department. Most of you have some background in signal processing. Uh, who's familiar with Fourier transforms? OK, who's not familiar with Fourier transforms? OK, good, good. It's, it's good that we have two. I, I saw two brave people. So for the two brave people, don't worry about it. You're not missing much, OK? Because the other people are not really going to understand anyway. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to think in analogs, OK? So Hamid over there is a signal processing guy. He's been doing signal processing for, for many years. And I'm going to ask Hamid to think in terms of analogs, OK? So here's the Deutsche, the Deutsche Josa problem. You don't have n equals 1. You have arbitrary n. And the problem is no longer are f of 1 and f0 equal or not. It is, is it a constant function or is it a balanced function? So um, a genie gives us a black box. And the genie tells us this is not like any black box. It's either a constant 0, constant 1, or it gives me 
half the time zero, half the time one. So it's a, it's a special, if it's not a constant, it's a special box. So now, what do we need to do in the classical world? I'm given this black box, and um, suppose that I run my, my black box on five random inputs, and all five times my answer was zero. So I think, well, this is uh, probably uh, the zero box. Or if I run it 20 times and I get a one, this is probably the one box. Um, but suppose that actually the, the genie tells us, hold on, hold on. Half the time I'm giving you a balanced box. So it's possible if I give you a balanced box that by chance the first five are going to be zeros or the first 20 will be ones. It's possible. And in the worst case, I need to go through half times 2 to the n times. I run the function and they're all the same. And only the next one shows me that it's actually a non-constant function. Now, this will be infrequent, but it could happen. So in the classical world, I need 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 queries. Tons of queries, right? Again, n could be 100 or 500. In the quantum world, I only need 1. So we now have an exponential separation. This is exponentially faster. And the fact that the quantum black box is five orders of magnitude slower than the, who cares? How does this work? So again, you know, Hamid has been studying signal processing for years, and Hamid knows all about uh, Fourier transforms. And Hadamard transforms are similar to Fourier transforms. They're analogous. And uh, in the Fourier world, we have frequencies, and we have frequencies in quotation marks in the Had Hadamard world, except that they're, they're over bits, zeros and ones. So we have kind of kind of frequencies, and there's a DC coefficient at the output of a Hadamard transformation. So the DC coefficient means, um, are we, how many ones and minus ones are there? How many ones and zeros are there? What's, what's the summation over all these things? And the DC coefficient happens to be for the 0, 0, 0, n times output. And that means that um, the squared magnitude of the DC coefficient is the probability that when we measure at the very end, everything is going to be 0. So, so now, going back to our problem, if it's a constant box, at the output of the black box before the second, had, uh, second round of Hadamards, um, everything is either plus 1 or minus 1. And therefore, so all these amplitudes are plus 1 or minus 1. And therefore, the DC coefficient is either plus or minus 1. And therefore, I always, I always measure all zeros. What if it's a balanced function? The DC coefficient is 0. If it's 0, it means that the probability of measuring all zero is 0. Never measure all zero. So I perform this oracle one time. I evaluate at the very end whether... I measure the all zeros. In that case, it's balanced or not. In that case, well, in the first case, it's constant. In the second case, it's balanced. All right. So again, I skipped a lot of steps here, but I was talking about the binary analog of frequencies. So um, at a more abstract level, what we really did here, we have three steps. The first step, and this is what Deutsch called rotate, compute, rotate. We rotate from our initialization to a uniform superposition. The compute step means that our black box, we run it in parallel 2 to the n times. And we create a superposition of 2 to the n answers. And then we rotate back. Uh, we're trying to get clues about the structure of our data, which is why we're calculating this Hadamard transform, which gives us information about frequency responses. And many quantum algorithms use a, an analogous approach. Rotating, computing, rotating. So there's more. Um, again, I was on sabbatical 2021, 2022. I, technically at Harvard, I was remote, and I was studying quantum computing. I read this green book by uh, Nielsen and Chuang, and this red book by uh, Mark Wild. And I also had discussions with numerous researchers and watched YouTube videos and read articles, you name it. And... Um, my research focus is based on the observation that the quantum gates are three or more orders of magnitude slower than 
uh, classical gates. Additionally, the quantum gates are noisy. And because of that, you need quantum error correction. And it's currently believed that error correction will add four or five orders of magnitude overhead, at least three. So um, to begin with, this quantum oracle is orders of magnitude slower. You know, five, six, seven orders of magnitude, may maybe even worse. That's really bad. And if, this, if the number of queries will be 20 times less, it's useless. So you need the number of queries to be way, 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 way lower, like many, many orders of magnitude lower. So I, I feel that in the medium term, at least, over the next decade, perhaps, quantum supremacy in quotation marks will be obtained only with, primarily with exponential speeds. So we, we need quantum algorithms that reduce the amount of computation exponentially. And one such family of problems is the hidden subgroup problem. So in group theory, you have mathematical structures and you have cosets. So imagine that I have a function and I'm running the function on every group theory element. And the function has the, the interesting property that for every coset, I'll have the same output. So that is called a hidden subgroup because I don't know the structure of the cosets. I don't know the structure of the subgroup that generates the cosets. So the cosets are implicitly contained in this function, but in the classical world, it, take, it would take a massive amount of computation to uncover them. And the hidden subgroup problem for various group theory constructions does this with a reduced number of queries, polynomial number of queries. So my colleague Bashko, in addition to uh, being friends with uh, Io and Tony, we also, uh, we have looked at the hidden subgroup problem. I showed you the Hadamard transforms. The rotate compute rotate is one instance of uh, the hidden subgroup problem. The Fourier transform, the quantum Fourier transform is another instance. And there are many more instances and we are attempting to map other group theory formulations that have applications <coughs> and where we'll have a very significant exponential speed. We've only scratched the surface here, but we're approaching the time at the end, so let me kind of move through the slides quickly. How can you get involved? So there are opportunities at NC State, the IBM Quantum Hub, which uh, is a partnership between IBM, many companies, many research institutes, many universities, and there are numerous researchers at NC State working on quantum. Some of them are affiliated with a hub, some are not. And you can actually run on a, a physical quantum computer. You can log on, you can open an account with IBM and log on to a physical quantum computer and perform these experiments and pretend that you're on Venus and Mars. There are also courses being offered. Um, this semester, Frank Muller of the Computer Science Department is offering a 500 level quantum computing course. It's also co-listed co with EC. Next semester, uh, our very own Huyang Zhao is going to uh, teach an advanced topics 792. And I'm going to teach a 492, 592 that provides a signal processing perspective on quantum. So for example, I'll go into the Fourier, the quantum Fourier in mathematical detail. I'll go into the Hadamard, the stuff that we discussed about in mathematical detail. And there are other departments that they have more courses. And in light of that, we are trying to design a quantum graduate certificate where you'll take four courses and you'll get a certificate. And these four courses will be, of course, structured in a way that they kind of make sense. They, they'll work together. We're also working on a quantum hub workshop, which will probably be in December or January. It'll be two days of presentations. For those of you who have less background, uh, there are going to be multiple tutorial talks, probably a total of uh, five, six hours of tutorials. And that'll allow you to understand the remaining presentations. Uh, there are also going to be invited talks, there are going to be poster sessions, there are going to be roundtable discussions, the works. So you're invited and stay tuned. So to summarize, Ryan O'Donnell said that quantum computers are good at looking for clues. Looking for clues meaning we need to run the, the, the second rotate at the end because the data is hidden in this superposition. Um, looking for clues in Lists of numbers, quantum amplitudes. Um, implicitly represented lists. Implicitly represented because they're buried inside 
the superposition. We cannot access it directly. And these are very, very long lists because they could be 2 to the 100, 2 to the 500. So I, I, think, uh, I think we can skip uh, this last slide, except for saying one thing, that uh, there are polynomial, and in some infrequent cases, exponential speedups, which, which sounds extremely impressive. And it's just a matter of time until, probably a matter of time, until, until some killer app will evolve. Um, but at this time, these exponential speedups are narrow. They're only for a few select algorithms. And it's likely that when it'll work on something which is you know, worth many, many billions of dollars, that sector of the economy will just skyrocket because they're going to have a computational superpower. But, at least initially, other things will not benefit from this exponential speedup. So these are narrow exponential speedups. And classical is not going to be obsolete anytime soon. Probably there are going to be pockets of quantum where quantum has amazing superpowers. But then stuff like browsing online and so on, we're going to keep doing classically. So that, that's it, and thanks for your attention. So I suppose in light of the time that people who want to leave should leave, and if there are questions, then those who want to remain can remain.